بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد فالسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن شاء الله we'll get right into the questions for today the first question is, ask, uh, is asking that in the last Q&A we spoke about sujood mentioning that the knees much, must touch the ground but if someone has a problem with their knee some of the prayers that they pray they do sitting down on a chair because they have a problem with their knee and they can't bend down so how do they pray? In this type of a situation, you're excused. In general, for a person who is physically able to, yes, they must uh, make sujood upon the seven body parts that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in the hadith. Umirtu an asjuda ala sab'ati a'zum ala al-jubha wa ashara biyadihi ila anfihi wal yadain wal rukbatain wa atraf al qadamain The Prophet ﷺ said that I have been ordered to make sujood upon seven body parts upon the forehead and he pointed to his nose so the forehead and the nose are included as one and the two hands and the two knees and the ends of both feet meaning the toes of both feet so that's a total of seven parts so the knees are included in that so yes a person must make sujood on his knees but if a person is unable to do that physically unable to do that and they're praying uh, sitting on a chair then uh, they are excused from that requirement because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Allah that keep your duty towards Allah as much as you are able to do but as for things that you are not able to do Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not hold you accountable for that so you are fine inshallah the next questioner is mentioning uh, this question is from a friend she has been coming to the masjid for more than 10 years her husband does not allow her to come to the masjid for tarawih prayers she goes out to work taking the bus and comes home late at night walking alone in the dark to get home. Why is it okay for a woman to go to work and do shopping alone, but not okay for her to come to the mosque for tarawih prayers? She wants to know, is it a sin if she does come to the mosque without her husband's permission? So the husband should not prevent his wife from coming to the masjid because the Prophet ﷺ said, لا تمنعوا إماء الله مساجد الله That do not prevent the women servants of Allah from going to the houses of Allah. So the husband should give the wife permission, especially if he is giving her permission to go out and go to work and go shopping and doing all of these things, then definitely he should give her permission to go and pray in the masjid. But at the same time, if he doesn't give her permission to go to the masjid, then that's his mistake. But still, she shouldn't go without his permission. He should give her permission. He should give her permission based upon this hadith, لا تمنعوا إماء الله مساجد الله Do not prevent the women servants of Allah from going to the houses of Allah. So he should allow her to go. But if he doesn't, and if he, he doesn't allow her to leave the house, then she has to stay at home. She can't go without his permission. Uh, but he should be advised about this hadith of the Prophet wasallam that he should allow her to go to the masjid. But if she remains patient upon this, if he doesn't give her permission and she stays home, seeking reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give her the reward of her intention. Inshallah, she will get the reward of praying, you know, in the in the masjid. She will get the reward of what whatever reward she would have received if she had gone to the masjid listening to the recitation of the Qur'an. She would get that reward, inshallah, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows her intention was to do that. And the only reason why she didn't do it is because she was prevented from doing so. But definitely the husband should be advised that he should not uh, prevent his wife from going to the masjid. Next questioner is asking, King Fahd Mosque is praying eight raka'at in taraweeh and eight raka'at in qiyam, followed by the witr. Can you point out to me from the hadith where this arrangement is mentioned or how it is permissible? Yes, this arrangement is permissible to pray uh, some part of the night prayer in the earlier part of the night and, and another part of the night prayer later in the night to, to divide it like this. There's no problem in doing this and there's no limit in the amount of raka'at that you can pray. The evidence for the fact that there is no limit in the number of raka'at that you can pray, like we're praying 16 raka'at, if, if some people are praying 20 raka'at, if some people are praying 40 raka'at, you know, more or less, whatever it is, there is no limit on the amount of raka'at you can pray in the night prayer. And the evidence for that is the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where he said, Salatu layli mathna mathna, fa'idha khashya ahadukum as subh salla raka'atan wahida tutiru lahu ma qad salla that the prayer of the night, the night prayer, it should be prayed two by two. And when one of you fears that the time of Fajr is about to come, then he should pray one raka'ah to make the total number odd. Pray one raka'ah of witr to make the total number odd. So here the Prophet wasallam he said, Salatul layli mathna mathna, that the, the night prayer is two by two. And he didn't say that there's any limit. You can pray two by two as much as you want, right? So that is the evidence that it is permissible to pray 
any number of rak'at as long as it, is, as it is done in multiples of two by two. Now the second part, is it permissible to pray some part of the night prayer in the earlier part of the night and then uh, pray another uh, part of the night prayer later on in the night? Is this permissible? And the answer to this is yes, this is also permissible. And the evidence for this is the hadith that is found in Sahih al-Bukhari, the hadith of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, where he says, Bittu fi bayti khalati maymuna. Fasalla Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al-isha. Thumma jaa'a fasalla arba'a raka'at. Thumma naam. Thumma qam. Fajitu faqumtu an yasarihi fajalani an yaminihi. Fasalla khamsa raka'at. Thumma salla raka'atain. Thumma naam. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, he was a child and he said that I spent the night at the house of my aunt, Maymuna. Maymuna was the aunt of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu and Maymuna was from the Ummahatul Mu'mineen. She was one of the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So that night, the nephew of Maymuna, Abdullah ibn Abbas, he was staying at his aunt's house and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa prayed Isha at the masjid. Then he came back home and he prayed four raka'at of Qiyamul Layl. He prayed four raka'at. So he prayed Qiyamul Layl, four raka'at, in the early part of the night after he came back home from Isha. He prayed four raka'at. Thumma nam. Then he went to sleep. Then he woke up again to pray. And Abdullah ibn Abbas saw that the Prophet ﷺ has gotten up to pray. So he stood to pray with him. He stood on his left side. So then the Prophet ﷺ changed his position. He took Abdullah, and, uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas and placed him on his right side. And then the Prophet ﷺ prayed five raka'at and then he prayed two raka'at. So he continued Qiyam al -Layl later on in the night after getting up from sleep. Right. So this is evidence that it is permissible to pray Qiyam al -Layl in portions. You can pray one part at one part of the night. And then, you know, you can take a break or sleep or whatever and pray another portion at the later part of the night. This is, this is fine, inshallah. So this is the evidence, the authentic evidence for this, that this is permissible. Next questioner is asking, I have invested a few thousand dollars to get shares in a company selling a digital product for online education. This is a long-term investment. I won't get any return on that investment unless the company goes public or is acquired. Should I pay zakat on that amount? If so, how should I proceed? All right, so... Paying zakat on shares, it depends. If, if your intention is to sell the shares, you're buying shares and selling shares, right? Then in that type of a situation, you would pay zakat on the value of the shares. You would pay your zakat on whatever the value of the shares is on the time that zakat is due. But if you're not buying and selling shares, you're buying shares as a long-term investment and you're not selling those shares, you just want to profit off the dividends of those shares. Then in that type of situation, you would not pay zakat on the value of the shares, but you would pay zakat on the profits that you make from those shares. You would pay, you would pay zakat upon the dividends that come. Now there is one point that also has to be emphasized is that if you have invested money, even if it's for a long-term investment, you're not selling the shares. You have bought the shares as a long-term investment, but that company has stores of cash. That company actually has cash. Then in that type of a situation, you are a partial owner of that cash, right? Depending on the percentage of your ownership of the company, how many shares you have, you have a certain percentage of ownership of the company. So if that company has cash stores, then you are technically an owner of a portion of that cash based upon your percentage of the ownership of the company. So you need to calculate how much of that cash you own if the company has cash stores. You have to calculate based upon your percentage of ownership of the company, how much of that cash is actually yours. And then you would have to pay zakat on that. Generally in Muslim countries, the, the company itself, they would take care of paying that zakat. But of course, if, if you're investing in a non-Muslim country, then you know the company is not going to be taking care of zakat on your behalf on, on the cash store. So you need to do that on your own. You need to find out how much cash the company has, how many zakatable assets the, the company has, the cash store that the company has. And uh, then you would have to calculate your percentage of ownership of that, how much belongs to you, the cash, and if there are any other zakatable assets, right? Then you need to calculate how much of that you own 
and you would pay the zakat on that. But if the company doesn't have any zakatable assets, it doesn't have any cash on hand, doesn't have any zakatable assets, then in that type of situation, if you're if you're if you have bought these shares as a long term investment, then you would not pay zakat on the value of the shares. Rather, you would only pay a zakat on the dividends that come in from those shares. The next question is asking if a Muslim missed years of zakat, should they make it up by calculating it based upon what they think they had in those years or what they have now? If they missed years of zakat, they need to calculate it based upon what they owed at that time, right? Because when the zakat became due those years and they didn't pay it, it became like a debt upon them. So they need to go back and calculate how much zakat was obligatory upon them during that time. And they need to make sure that they pay all of that off. It's a debt on their shoulders, right? And if, if it's difficult to estimate, then you should err on the side of caution. You should, instead of, you know, paying less than what was owed, you know, pay some extra to make sure that you have fulfilled your obligation, right? So it's very important to do that correctly, inshallah. Next question is asking, what is the ruling for zakat distribution? For example, if every year I calculate my zakat on the 10th of Ramadan, but when, when must the zakat reach its recipients? Is it any time during that month every year, or is it bound to reach its recipients by a specific date, exactly one year from when it's due? All right, so the strongest opinion is that once zakat becomes due, once you have had the nisab, and you have had it for one hijri year, once those conditions are met, zakat becomes due immediately. You cannot delay paying your zakat. So you should pay it as fast as possible, right? And you should not delay. There is an opinion in the Hanafi madhab that allows it to be delayed, right? But of course, you shouldn't delay it so much that, you know, the next year comes in and the next year's zakat becomes obligatory. You shouldn't delay it that much, right? So according to the Hanafi opinion, you can delay it. It is not due immediately. But of course, it should not be delayed up to the, the next year. But according to the strongest opinion, this is the, the Hanbali opinion and the Maliki opinion, that is once it becomes due, you, you cannot delay it. Rather, it must be paid immediately, as soon as possible. So the conditions have been met, the year uh, has been completed, you pay it uh, as quickly as possible. That's the best thing to do and that's the safest thing to do because this is the right of the poor. Zakat is the right of the poor. You're not doing a favor upon the poor by giving them zakat. Rather, you know, this is their haq, this is their right. So you cannot delay their right. When, when, when the conditions are met, when the year has been completed, that means their right is due. So what right do you have to, to not give them their right? That, that's their money. You know? that's, that's the, that, that, that money belongs to the poor, to the recipients of the zakat. So by you delaying it, you know, this, is, this is something that should not be done. You should give them their right immediately. You should give them their right immediately. So this is the strongest opinion that yes, once it becomes due, you pay it immediately. Uh, yes, there is an opinion in the Hanafi Madhab that it, you know, that you do not have to pay it immediately. That you can, you know, you can pay it over uh, the course of some time, as long, of course, as it doesn't reach the the time of zakat being obligatory the next year. But the best thing to do, pay it as soon as possible. Pay it as quickly as possible, and that is the strongest opinion, and that's the best thing to do, inshallah. The next questioner is asking. I have heard that whenever one is stuck during any kind of travel or movement, like stuck in traffic or can't find parking or the elevator is stuck, that reciting Surah Quraysh will help make way. This is because in this Surah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about how he has set forth the caravans of the Quraysh. Is reciting this Surah during these times, such as being stuck in traffic an innovation or this is okay to do? No, this is an innovation. There's no basis uh, for doing this from the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, there's no hadith, there's no narration that mentions, uh, you know, the 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 uh, pre that that reciting surah, surah Quraysh in this type of situation is prescribed. So it's an it's an innovation, it's a bid'ah, and it should not be done. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Man ahdatha fi amrina hada ma laysa minhu, fahuwa rad." That whoever uh, bring something new, whoever innovates into this matter of ours, into this religion of ours, whoever innovates into Islam, something that is not part of it, it will be rejected. So this is a practice that has no basis in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So it should be avoided. Next questioner is asking: Is there any extra reward for giving zakat during Ramadan rather than any other time during the year? Is it like all other deeds, such as salah, that get multiplied rewards during the month of Ramadan? Any good deed that is done during the month of Ramadan, inshallah, the reward is greater. So that applies for zakat too. But that doesn't mean that if zakat has become due to you before Ramadan, that you should delay it and pay it in Ramadan. For example, let's say you got some some money in in the month of of uh, of Muharram, 
you got some money in the month of Muharram. And it was above the Nisab. And you had that money for the whole year and now Muharram has come again for the next year. Can you say like, no, I'm going to wait you know, for a few months. I'm going to wait for, for eight months for Ramadan and then I'm going to pay this in Ramadan. It has become due in, in, in Muharram. And you're going to delay it for eight more months to pay it in Ramadan? No, this is not permissible. This is not permissible. When zakat becomes due, as we mentioned in the previous question, when zakat becomes due, you pay it uh, as quickly as possible and you do not delay it, right? But if your zakat happens to be due in Ramadan, then yes, you pay it in Ramadan and inshallah, there's a, there's a great virtue in doing that. Now, the person who wants to pay his zakat in Ramadan, let's say the person got, a person got an amount of wealth in Muharram. And he wants to pay his zakat in Ramadan. How can he manage this? How can he do this in a permissible way? What he can do is pay his zakat in advance. So he got his wealth in Muharram. It will, the zakat will become due in the next Muharram. Right? But instead of paying it in Muharram, he waits not for the next Ramadan after it becomes due, but he waits for the Ramadan before it becomes due. Right? So Muharram is the first month of the Hijri year. Right? So zakat will not become due until the first month of the next Hijri year. But instead of waiting all the way for zakat to be due, he pays his zakat in eight months when Ramadan comes. Ramadan is the ninth month. So instead of waiting 12 months to pay his zakat, he just waits for eight, eight months. And then he pays his zakat in the month of Ramadan. So this is permissible because you know he did not delay his zakat. Rather, he paid his zakat in advance in Ramadan. And then you know when the next Ramadan comes, again, he pays his zakat in Ramadan. And again, that's in advance. That's, that's again in advance because, you know, his, his Ramadan was, his, his, his zakat was due every Muharram, but instead he's paying it, not the Ramadan that comes after it is due, but the Ramadan that comes before it is due. So he's paying it in, in advance. And this is something that is permissible. So if you want to set your, your zakat to be paid every year during the, during the month of Ramadan, you can do it in this way. By, by paying it, uh, in advance, as long as you're not delaying any zakat after it has become due. So if you're doing it in, in, an, uh, in an advanced basis, then inshallah that is permissible. And in that way, you can set a date every Ramadan where you pay your zakat. And inshallah in this way, it will be permissible and you will not be delaying any of your zakat. The next question is asking, for the prayer between the two adhans mentioned in the hadith, should we intend for general two rak'at nafil or a specific sunnah. Okay, so the questioner is mentioning, is talking about the hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Bayna kulli adhanayni salah. Bayna kulli adhanayni salah. Bayna kulli adhanayni salah liman sha. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he repeated it three times. And then at the end of the third one, he said liman sha. Between every two adhans, there is a prayer. Between every two adhans, there is a prayer. Between every two adhans, there is a prayer for who, whoever wishes. And... Between every two adhans, what it means here is between the adhan and the iqama. The iqama is, is being referred to as an adhan here as well. So, bayna kulli adhanayni salah, meaning between every adhan and iqama, there is a salah. Meaning that a person, it is permissible for a person if there is a time, you know, let's say he goes to the masjid and the adhan is called at a certain time and the iqama is called like 15 minutes later or 20 minutes later, so he has a lot of time. It is permissible for him to pray as much as he wants. He can pray nafil prayers during this time between the adhan and the uh, iqama, right? Uh, there is an exception for this. That is the the fajr prayer between the adhan and the iqama of fajr. You can only pray the two rakat, the two sunnah prayer of of uh, fajr, right? But you don't pray extra nafils during that time. But as for other prayers between the Adhan and the Iqama of Dhuhr, between the Adhan and the Iqama of Asr, between the Adhan and the Iqama of Maghrib, between the Adhan and the Iqama of Isha, you're allowed to pray, uh, you know, two by two Nafil prayers as much as you want. So this is what this Hadith means. Next question is asking, I had a question about this Hadith with regards to Ramadan and Taraweeh, uh, Qiyam. Uh, so the, the Hadith that the questioner is mentioning here, uh, is the hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Man qama bi'ashri ayatin fi laylatin lam yuktab min al-ghafilin wa man qama bi'mi'ati ayatin fi laylatin lam yuktab uh, wa man qama bi'mi'ati ayatin kutiba min al-qanitin wa man qama bi'alfi ayatin kutiba min al-muqantilin the Prophet ﷺ said that whoever stands in prayer and recites 
uh, 10 verses of the Quran in the night prayer, then this person will not be written from the, uh, from the ignorant ones, or he will not be written from the heedless ones. And a person who recites a hundred verses in the night prayer in the night, this person will be written from the qanitin, from the obedient servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whoever uh, stands in prayer and recites 1,000 verses in the night prayer, this person will be written from al-muqantirin. Al-muqantirin, the people who get huge rewards, right? So this is the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ mentioned these different levels of rewards. You, you, you pray in the night prayer and you recite 10 verses, you will, you will not be written from the heedless ones. You pray in the night and you recite 100 verses, you will be written from the obedient ones. You pray in the night and you recite 1,000 verses, you will be written from the people who have huge rewards. So the questioner is asking about this hadith that if you are praying with the imam, does his recitation count for you? And the answer to that question is yes, inshallah, it does. So if you came for the taraweeh prayer and the, the imam recited 100 verses and you were praying behind him and you listened to those 100 verses, then inshallah, yes, that is written for you as well, inshallah, and you will be counted in getting those rewards as well, bi idhnillah. The next questioner is saying, recently someone advised me not to sit leaning on my left hand only as it is haram. I verified the hadith, but it mentioned leaning on the palm of your left hand behind you. However, what I sometimes do after a four rak'ah prayer ending with tawarruk, I just lean on my left side with my left hand to my left, not behind me. Is this included in the hadith meaning? This should also be avoided. Yes, there are narrations that mention uh, the impermissibility of leaning on the palm of your left hand behind your back. And this is known as Jalsatul Maghdubi alayhim. This is the way that the people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's anger was upon, this is how they used to sit, right? So we should avoid that. But there, there are some other narrations. There's a narr narration of Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhu that does not mention sitting on the hand, sitting on the left hand behind the back. It just mentions leaning on, leaning on the left hand. It doesn't mention anything about behind the back. There's a narration where Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu saw a man uh, sitting and he was leaning on the palm of his left hand. And then Abdullah ibn Umar prohibited him from doing that. And he said, this, this is the way of sitting of the people who are punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So do not sit like this. So, you know, it should be avoided in general. Just sitting and leaning on the palm of the left hand, whether it's behind the back or, or whether it's just on the, on the side, uh, this should be avoided in all, in all situations, inshallah. And you should instead lean on the right hand or it's permissible to lean on both hands. You know, if you lean on the left and the right hand, even if it's behind the back, then there's no problem in doing that. But leaning only on the palm of the left hand, whether it's behind the back or not, this is something that should be avoided, inshallah. Next question is asking, regarding money that you don't have access to, like a frozen bank account, for example, you answered it long ago, but I cannot find it. From what I recall, we should pay one year zakat when we finally get access to it. Yes, this is correct. If you had money that you didn't have access to, like a frozen bank account that has been frozen for many years, and you, you can't, you're trying to get access to that money, but you cannot get access to that money, then you do not have to pay zakat upon that money. But once you do get access to it, then pay one year worth of zakat immediately. Uh, and inshallah, that covers you know all the years. That, that, that covers the whole period that it was frozen. You do not have to pay for every year that it was frozen. Rather, pay one year and it takes care of the whole thing, inshallah. And now that you have access to it, you will pay zakat on it every year. Uh, he, the questioner is asking, does the same type of thing apply to a debt that someone owes us? Uh, the questioner mentions, I had a roommate who didn't pay me his rent, a significant amount. He made excuses for one year and I pays, paid zakat on it the following year. Then he blocked all communication with me and I tried reaching him through others to no use. I paid zakat on it a second time last year. I'm trying to contact him again via different people. However, if it doesn't work, can I just stop paying zakat, assuming it's never coming back and then pay one year at the end of it if he does pay it. So he owes you this money. Uh, and it seems from the question that you do not have high hopes of ever getting it back. So in this type of situation, if it's a debt that you do not have hope of getting it back, then you do not have to pay a zakat on it. You do not have to pay zakat on it. And once you receive it, then inshallah, you can pay one year of zakat on it. And then, uh, you know, now that you have the money, you would pay zakat on it every year from that point on. But for debts that you don't have hope that you're ever going to get it back, you know, zakat is not due upon these types of debts. When you get it, then yes, inshallah, the best thing to do, pay one year worth of zakat on it. 
and uh, uh, you know, then you can go on from there every year paying zakat in it because now you have now you have it in your hand. But during those years where you don't have any access to it, and you know the person has basically ghosted you, and he's not, uh, you know, he's not returning your calls, and you know, it means that there, there's a high likelihood that you're probably not going to get this money back. So in this type of situation where you have a strong feeling that you're probably not going to get it, then in that type of situation you don't have to pay zakat on it. Yes, you will pay zakat in it once you receive it. That's the safest thing to do. Once you receive it, pay one year worth of zakat in it and you'll be fine, inshallah. Next question is, what is the strongest opinion regarding the number of takbirat for Salatul Eid? The strongest opinion regarding this is that there are seven takbirs in the first rak'ah before the recitation and five takbirs in the second rak'ah before the recitation. This is a, based upon the hadith that is found in the Sunan of At-Tirmidhi. أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كبر في العيدين في الأولى سبعا قبل القراءة وفي الآخرة خمسا قبل القراءة. That the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم in both of the Eid prayers, Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha, that he he did seven takbirs before the recitation in the first rak'ah and five takbirs. Before the recitation in the second rak'ah, so seven extra takbirs, seven takbirs in the first rak'ah, and there's a difference of opinion of some of the ulama. These seven takbirs, does it include takbiratul ihram, the original takbir? So it's it's actually the the opening takbir of salah plus six extra takbirs for a total of seven, or is it seven separate takbirs after takbiratul ihram? Right, there are two opinions regarding that, and whichever opinion a person is following, it's fine, inshallah. But yes, seven takbirs. Uh, before the qira'ah in the first rak'ah and five takbirs before the qira'ah in the second rak'ah. This is, this is the strongest opinion. Uh, as for the Hanafis, they do it a little bit differently. They pray a total of six extra takbirs. Six extra takbirs. Three extra takbirs in the first rak'ah before the recitation and three extra takbirs in the second rak'ah after the recitation before ruku'ah. Right? So the, the Hanafis, the way that they would pray the eighth prayer is they will start with the takbir of the ihram, Allahu Akbar. And then they would do three extra takbirs. Then they would re recite Surah Al-Fatiha. Then they would recite another surah. Then uh, they would finish the first rakah and they would stand up for the second rakah. And once they stand up for the second rakah, they would immediately recite Surah Al-Fatiha and they would recite another surah. Then after reciting the other surah, they would do three extra takbirs. And then after those three extra, extra takbirs, they would make the takbir to go into ruku'ah. So this is the way that the Hanafis pray Salatul Eid. And they do this based upon a, a narration from Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. And there is a narration from Abdullah ibn Mas'ud that mentions this. So that's fine as well. But the strongest way, which is you know, attributed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself, is what we mentioned initially. Seven takbirs in the first rak'ah. Seven takbirs in the first rak'ah before the recitation. And five takbirs in the second rak'ah before the recitation. This is what is authentically narrated, you know, uh, and it is attributed directly to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. An Nabiya sallallahu alaihi wasallam kabbara fil idaini. An An Nabiya sallallahu alaihi wasallam kabbara fil idaini fil ula sab'an qabl al qira'ah wa fil akhira khamsan qabl al qira'ah. That the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He prayed in, in both of the Eid prayers. He would do the takbirs, seven takbirs before the recitation. Seven takbirs before the recitation in the first rakah and five takbirs before the recitation in the second rakah. So this is the most authentic way to do it, inshallah. The next question is asking, if someone recites Surah Al-Kahf at the night, at the night prayer of Friday night, does he need to recite it again on Friday? If he recited it on, on the night that came before the day of Friday, meaning the night that comes after Thursday day, right? Uh, then inshallah that covers it. He does not have to recite it again on the day of Friday because he can recite it on the night that precedes the day of Friday or the day of Friday. And, you know, both of those are permissible and he will get the reward for that inshallah. There is a hadith about reciting Surah Al-Kahf on, on, on Friday night, meaning the night that precedes the day of Friday. Uh, there's, a hadith, there's a narration uh, of Abu Sa'id Al-Khudri, where he says, Man qara'a... Surah Al-Kahfi, Laylat Al-Jumu'ati, Adha'a lahu min al-Nuri fi ma baynahu wa bayna al-Bayt al-Atiq. That Abu, Abu, Sa Abu Sa'id Al-Khudri, radiallahu anhu, he says that whoever recites Surah Al-Kahf on the night of Jumu'ah, uh, then uh, this person will have a light that shines for him, 
between himself and between Al Bayt Al Atiq. Al Bayt Al Atiq is the Kaaba. So you have a light between yourself and the Kaaba for reciting Surah Al Kaf on the night of Jum'ah. This, this hadith mentions Laylat Al Jum'ah. Uh, then there's another hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Man qara'a surat al kahfi fi yawm al jumu'ati adha'a lahu min al nuri ma bayn al jumu'atain." That whoever recites surat al kahf on the day of Jumu'ah, then this person will have a light that shines for him between the two Jumu'ahs, from this Jumu'ah to the next Jumu'ah. So reciting it on the night of Jumu'ah or the day of Jumu'ah, both of them are permissible, and inshallah, both of them, uh, both of them are are very uh, highly rewarded, inshallah. Next question is asking, my university asked me to take part in a survey and those who will participate will be entered into a drawing for some gift cards. Is it permissible to take part in this? Yes, there's no problem taking part in this, inshallah, because you're not putting any money into this. You're just taking a survey. You're not, you're not putting any money into it. So it's not a gamble. If, if there was an entrance fee for this, like you have to pay some money and take this survey, and then there's a chance that you can win a gift card, then this would not be permissible because this would be a form of gambling because you're giving some money uh, you know, in a hope of receiving this gift card. And you might receive it or you might not. Then this is a gamble. But if there's no money involved, you know, you just have to take a survey and it's free. And, you know, then you're entered into a drawing where you can win a gift card, then this is fine. And it is permissible to take part in this, inshallah. Next question is asking, can we add an extra sujood after completing the salah to make dua? This is something that is not prescribed. You can make dua after salah, that's fine. But making sujood right after salah in order to, to make dua, this is something that the Prophet ﷺ did not practice. And it is something that is not narrated from the Prophet ﷺ. It is not found in the Quran or the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. So it's a type of innovation to do this. So after salah, uh, you know, you can, you can make dua, it's fine. Uh, if you want to make dua in sujood, then do it in salah. If you want to make dua in sujood, and making dua in sujood is one of the is one of the best places where you can make sujood, as the Prophet said, "Aqrabu ma yakunu al-abdu min Rabbihi wa huwa sajid fa akthiru dua." That the closest that the servant of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, the closest that the slave of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is to his Lord, is when he is in sujood. So make a lot of dua. So this is prescribed, but this 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 sujood is referring to the sujood of salah, right? So when you're making sujood in salah, then uh, make a lot of du'a, make a lot of du'a. But as for just, you know, just making sujood only for the purpose of making du'a, making a separate sujood only for the purpose of making du'a, this is something that is not prescribed in the uh, sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So if you want to make du'a in sujood, then pray a nafil prayer, pray two rakat, and then make a sujood and make as much du'a as you want in that sujood. That's the way to do it, inshallah. Next question is asking, can we listen to a person who supports LGBTQ? Can we follow his lectures on topics like seerah or dua? No, this person should completely uh, be avoided. You shouldn't listen to him on any subject at all. If he supports LGBT, you know, that means he supports something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has clearly made haram. This is a type of kufr. For someone to say that, you know, living an LGBT lifestyle is halal. To sub, for somebody to support that and say that it's permissible, this is kufr actually. This is disbelief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you cannot take anything from a person. You should not even pray behind a, such a person. It's not permissible. It's not valid even to pray salah behind such a person if he considers LGBT lifestyle to be permissible. Your salah is not valid behind this person. You should not listen to anything that this person has to say. Whether he's talking about any, even if he's talking about something that's unrelated to this, even if he's talking about seerah or dua or whatever subject, you should not listen to him, at, to him at all. And you should warn other people from listening to this type of a person as well. Next questioner is asking, I was expecting some money and I made a niyyah to give a charity in Ramadan. But the money didn't come through in time and now my charity will go after Ramadan. So will I still get the reward like giving charity in Ramadan since I made the niyyah in Ramadan? Inshallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is akramul akrameen. He is the most generous of those who are generous. And he knows what your intention is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, rewards people according to their intentions. إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مْرِئِمْ مَا نَوَى Surely actions are, are judged and rewarded according to their intentions, and every man will have what he intended. So if you were really expecting that this money would come in Ramadan, you were thinking that it is going to come to you in Ramadan, and you really had a firm intention that you are going to give the charity in Ramadan, then inshallah you will get that reward, even if you got the money after Ramadan. Bismillah. Next question is asking, if someone missed Ramadan fasting due to health reasons or pregnancy, and is not able to make up the fasting, what is the ruling on it? Also, if we want to feed or give some money to the poor, how to calculate that portion? All right, if a person is not able to fast and they're not able to make up those fasts, if a person was sick, like with a temporary, temporary type of sickness, 
right? And they weren't able to fast, then this person should make up those fasts later when, when, when they become healthy again. But if it's a permanent illness, a chronic illness where this person can never fast, then this person has to pay the fidya. And the fidya is to feed a poor person for each day of fasting that you missed. So how much food should you give a poor person for every day of fasting that you miss? You give them nisf sa'ar, half a sa'ar. So it's, it's about like 1.5 uh, kilograms of the staple food, like 1.5 kilograms of rice or, you know, 1.5 kilograms of, of barley or something like that, right? You give it to a poor person for every day that you miss. This is the fidya for a person who is permanently unable to fast. And it has to be done in food, right? You can't just give a, the person cash. You can give cash to an organization that will buy food and give food to the recipients on your behalf. That's okay. But as for, you know, just directly giving cash to the recipients of the fidya, this is something that is not permissible because Allah subhanahu Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has specified فَفِدْيَةٌ طَعَامُ miskin. The fidya is ta'am miskin, Feeding a poor person, right? So either you give food to a poor person yourself or you give money to an organization that will buy food and give that food to the poor people on your behalf. This is how you pay the fidya. Uh, another way to do it is to invite 30 poor people. Like you miss 30 days of fasting, right? So after Ramadan is over, you invite 30 poor people, not just 30 people, but 30 poor people. You invite 30 poor people to a lunch or to a dinner. And you feed each of them with a full good meal. Then inshallah, you know, your fidya is taken care of in that way. Because you fed a poor person for every day that you missed. You fed 30 poor people with a full meal. Right? So you, take, you have taken care of one whole month's worth of fidya by doing this. That's perhaps the easier way to do it that a lot of people like to do. You know, just uh, provide one lunch or one dinner for 30 poor people, a full lunch or, or a full dinner, right? One full meal, whether it's lunch or dinner, for 30 people after the month of Ramadan, 30 poor people after the month of Ramadan is over, and inshallah your fidya is taken care of uh, in that way. As for a pregnant woman or a breastfeeding woman, the majority of the ulama have said that, you know, because pregnancy is temporary and breastfeeding is also temporary, that, you know, these women have to make up those fasts. But there is an opinion of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, where he said that a pregnant woman who missed her Ramadan or breastfeeding women who missed their Ramadan because of the situation, they don't have to make up the fast. Rather, they can also pay the fidya. Uh, and there is actually, if you look at it, there is a difference between a person who, is, who has a temporary sickness and a woman who is pregnant or a woman who is breastfeeding. person who is temporarily sick, maybe he's going to be sick for three or four days, maybe a week or something, right? So he missed a few days. It's easy for him to make up those fasts afterward. But as for a pregnant woman, she may miss the whole Ramadan all 30 days because of the pregnancy. Then after she gives birth and she's breastfeeding her child for a year or for two years, she, will, she may miss you know, two more Ramadans. Then maybe she gets pregnant again during that time. She has another kid and you know, the cycle keeps going on and on. So she may miss multiple Ramadans, hundreds of days, right? And it's, it's something very difficult for her then to make up. How is she gonna make up you know, uh, uh, six Ramadan, seven Ramadans, 180 days, 210 days. How is she going to make that up? That's, that's something that's very difficult. So the opinion of Abdullah bin Abbas is that a pregnant woman or a breastfeeding woman, uh, they don't have to make up those fasts. Rather, they can, they can pay the fidya. Uh, and inshallah, that takes care of the situation for them as well. And this, you know, even though this is a minority opinion, this opinion of Abdullah bin Abbas, uh, it, it's an opinion that I feel carries a lot of weight. Uh, you know, if you look at it from a practical sense and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Next questioner is asking, I do not have a job and my parents provide for me financially. I'm a young adult and I have savings in cash. Do I still have to pay zakat on my total savings? If your savings have reached the nisab and you have had that amount for one hijri year, then yes, you must pay zakat. Even if you're not working, even if you don't have you know, an, an income that's constantly coming in. If you do have savings that are at the minimal, minimum, minimum threshold of zakat and you have had that for a year, then yes, zakat would become obligatory upon that and you would have to pay the 2.5%. And the last questioner today is asking, is it better for women to pray at home? There's a hadith about a woman who told the Prophet ﷺ that she loves to pray behind him, but he responded by saying that it is better that she prays at home. There's another hadith that says that whoever prays with the imam from start to finish, then uh, the reward is as if that person prayed all night. All right, so in general, in general, uh, it's better for a woman to pray at home, but there are certain situations where it may be better for her to pray at the masjid, right? Uh, 
As for certain situations where it may be better for her to pray at a masjid, is if she would have more khushur, if she would have more focus and more concentration in her salah if she's praying behind the imam in a masjid. For example, for salat al-taraweeh during the month of Ramadan. You know, many women, maybe they don't, they don't, they haven't memorized many surahs and you know, it, it, it would be difficult for them to pray long prayers in the night, uh, to pray taraweeh prayers or tahajjud prayers because they don't, they, they haven't memorized many surahs so they cannot recite much. They cannot recite, you know, uh, for a long period of time. But if they come to the masjid and, you know, they're praying behind an imam and the imam is reciting, you know, the whole Qur'an and she's able to hear the recitation of the Qur'an and focus more and have more khushu'ah, then in this type of situation, it, it could be better for her to actually pray in the masjid. So it depends on her, her, her own situation as well. What would be more beneficial for her spiritually? You know, if she feels more of a connection and she feels like, you know, she's, she's more dedicated and more concentrated and, 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 and more into her salah, if she's praying behind the imam in the masjid in that type of situation, then in that type of situation, it would be better for her to come and pray in the masjid if she can't get that same type of khushur uh, at home. Also, another situation where it may be better for a woman to pray uh, in the masjid or to come to the masjid is, for example, if there are lessons, if there are uh, classes going on in the masjid, for example, where she can learn, right? And she, she doesn't have access to that at home. So she comes to the masjid in order to benefit from these lessons. And, you know, while she's there in the masjid, she also prays in the masjid. So in these type of scenarios, it could be better for her to actually come to the masjid rather than staying at home. But the general rule, yes, the general rule for, for the most part is that the salah of a woman in her home, the prayer of a woman in her home is better than the prayer at the masjid. But, you know, there are certain exceptions as, as we have mentioned here. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Barakallahu feekum, wallahu alam, sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.